Hi everyone, I'm going to take you through the four methods that we would have learned in class um, in order to calculate enthalpy of a reaction. The first one is using experimental data. So as we see, a 6.4 gram sample of sulfur is introduced into a calorimeter containing 200 grams of water. When the sulfur sample is burned completely, it forms sulfur dioxide, and the water temperature is observed to rise by 71 degrees. That should be degrees Celsius there. Determine delta H for the reaction in kilojoules per mole of sulfur. So what I'm going to do very quickly is I'm going to write down what is given. So I have the mass of sulfur is 6.4 grams. The mass of my water is 200 grams. And the change in temperature is 71 degrees. So it rose 71 degrees. So final minus initial, it doesn't matter what initial and final temperatures you pick, as long as the change is 71. And what they're looking for is delta H of the combustion reaction for sulfur. So that is my question mark. My target equation would be Q of the combustion of sulfur all over moles of sulfur, Q over N. And we also know that moles can be substituted with mass of sulfur over the molar mass of sulfur. So we can use that instead. So moving forward, what we want to do is we want to figure out Q of the water by doing MC delta T. So we have 200 grams times 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius for water with a change in temperature of 71 degrees Celsius. We notice that our Celsius cancel out, our grams cancel out, and what we are left with is joules, 59,356 joules. Now, because the question is asking us to report our answer in kilojoules per mole, I might as well go ahead and convert that into kilojoules while we're at it. So that would be 59.356, I just divided by 1,000 kilojoules of energy was absorbed by the water. So that means in the combustion of the sulfur, that is the number of kilojoules, I just flipped the sign, that would have been released. So Q lost equals Q gained. Now what I want to do is I want to calculate delta H of the reaction by substituting in Q of the sulfur, which is negative 59.356 kilojoules. I take my mass of the sulfur, which was 6.4 grams. I divide it by the molar mass of sulfur, which I looked up to be 32.065 grams per mole. What I notice my grams cancel out, I'm left with kilojoules per mole. And when I divide, I get, and I'll show you how I would enter that in on my calculator in one shot here. So I would do 59.356, and I would divide that, close bracket, 6.4 divided by 32.065, close bracket, and I get that big number. Now when I go back and I take a look at my sig fig, here, I actually only have one sig fig. If there was a decimal there, then I would have three sig fig, but that's only one significant digit. So how do I report that value? Well, two different ways. You could report that as negative 300 kilojoules per mole, or you could do three, negative three, times one, two, times 10 to the two kilojoules per mole mole. Okay, for example number two, what you want to do is you want to use bond energies in order to determine the enthalpy value and what you need to do is you need to draw Lewis structures. So this is where your organic unit would come into play. So you've got methane plus chlorine gas. Now chlorine, we know each chlorine has um, a valence of seven. So it would actually form one link. And if I was to do that, I go around and do my Lewis dots, I see, okay, one link. So we're gonna clean that up, chlorine. And that leaves me with one chloromethane. And we've also got some HCl. What you would want to do is you would want to go and consult your bond energy table which um, you can find on the thermal review, there it is there. Um, and you also have it on the back of your periodic table as well. 
So when I go to take a look at the values, I see that I have four carbon hydrogen bonds and I've got one chlorine. So I would times that by four. I have one chlorine chlorine bond. And when I look those up, I've got four times 413 is the amount of energy needed to break those bonds. I've got one chlorine chlorine bond that requires this much energy input to break. And so on the left, I have energy in that's required, and that equals 1,894 kilojoules of energy. When I take a look at my product side, I see that I have three carbon hydrogen bonds. So I will do three times 413. I've got one carbon chlorine bond, and that is 328 kilojoules of energy released when those bonds come back together. And the hydrogen chlorine bond over here is going to release 431 kilojoules of energy. So remember, bond formation releases energy. Bond breaking requires an input. So this is energy out. So when I tally that all up, I get 1,998 kilojoules of energy that is put out of the system. So in order to calculate delta H using bond energies, what you do is you take the sum of your energy in and you subtract the sum of your energy out. And in this case, you get 1,894 kilojoules. Subtract 1,998. And that leaves us with negative 104 kilojoules per mole, um, per mole of methane, I guess, in this particular reaction. So that's how you calculate enthalpy using bond energies. Now what we want to do is we want to take a look at how we use Hess's law. Now when we're looking at Hess's law, this is our third method. What we have got here is we have a reaction mechanism. Here is your complex overall reaction. And so what they're saying is that this reaction actually takes place in a series of steps. If we know the enthalpy of each elementary step, we can figure out what the net reaction would be if this reaction was to take place in one step. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to balance this equation. Now I'm going to balance it it's asking us to determine per kilojoule of sul um, zinc sulfate. Now I could balance this so that this remains a one and then I will have some fractions. I'm going to balance this so that um, I have whole numbers and I'll deal with my enthalpy value at the end. So what I've got here is I've got eight sulfur. So I need to put an eight in front here. And that means I will have eight zinc. And that changes my number of oxygens on the right to 20, oh, 32. And so here I need to put a 16. And I think everything is balanced. So what I want to do is I want to start manipulating these reactions and these elementary steps, I should say, so that they look like my target equation. So I want to start off with one elementary step that only has one item um, found in the target equation. Okay, so again, this is my target equation. So I'm going to deal with elementary step number one. So here we have zinc, and it's the only one that contains just zinc. Here, there's eight of them. So what I want to do is I want to multiply this reaction by eight. Whatever I do to this, because it's a reactant, I don't want to flip this or anything. I want to leave this where it is because that's where it is here. It's on the left. I would want to also multiply this by eight. So very quickly, I will rewrite that out. And I want to make sure that I leave the states that they're in in order to cross off like states later on. So 8 times 1 8 is just 1. So that gives me sulfur and that's solid. And then this becomes an 8. Okay. And then this value up here becomes negative 1,471.31. Then what I want to do is I want to look for something else. 
So I think that would bring me to reaction number four here. Reaction number four has zinc sulfate in it. It's the only one that has zinc sulfate in it. And I see that it's also part of my target equation. It is a product in this elementary step and I want it to be a product. The only difference here is there's only one mole and I want eight moles. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply step four by eight as well. I'm not gonna flip it or do anything like that. So that will give me eight zinc oxides plus eight sulfur trioxides. And that will give me eight zinc sulfates. That means that I also have to multiply this by eight and that will give me um, negative 1842 decimal five six. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for another reaction. Now, all of these other reactions, when I look at them very closely, none of them have anything that is common to the net reaction. So what that means is I need to use these reactions in order to help me get rid of things that I don't want, okay, that are not part of the overall reaction. So I'm going to take a look at step three right now. And I'm going to see that step three um, has sulfur trioxide and step two doesn't. But I noticed that I've already manipulated step four and it has sulfur trioxide. It's got eight of them. And over here, there's two of them. Now, I want the sulfur trioxides to disappear, okay, because they are not part of this overall equation. So the only way that you can cross them off is, is if they're on opposite sides of the arrow. So here I've already manipulated this equation. I don't want to touch it again. I happen to have eight on the left. So in order to get rid of them, I need another reaction to have eight on the right. And so with reaction number three, I want to multiply this by four, leave it where it is. So in doing so, I'm going to have eight sulfur dioxides. I'm going to have four oxygens. And I'm going to have eight sulfur trioxides. And that's good because eventually those will cancel out and that's what I want to have happen. So when I multiply this reaction by four, because that's what I did, um, that would become negative 784.16. Now the last equation is number two. And what I want to do is take a look at, is there something that I want to also get rid of? Now, I noticed that zinc oxide is not part of this reaction, and I see that it is in step two. And so I can use this step to help me get rid of the zinc oxide. There's eight on the left here, so that means I want eight on the right. So that means that I need to change this two to an eight somehow. What that means is I would want to multiply this reaction by four. What I want to do is multiply that, so that becomes eight zinc sulfides plus 12 oxygens yielding eight zinc oxides plus eight sulfur dioxides. Now I've multiplied this by four and what that becomes is negative 3,710.16 when I do that. Now, if I had to um, um, flip any of those equations, then the signs would have flipped as well. So now what I can do is I can start crossing off things that are um, on opposite sides of the arrow. So if I take a look really closely, I can see that I have eight zinc um, sulfides that I can cross off. I have got eight sulfur trioxides and I have eight sulfur dioxides. And is there anything else that I can cross off? Yes, there we go, the eight zinc oxides. And what I should be left with is everything that's in my target equation. There we go. If I combine these, I've got my 16 oxygens and then I've got my eight zinc. Um, sulfates. So what I do is then I want to take all of my enthalpy values and when I calculate the enthalpy for the reaction above, I add those all up and I get negative 7,808.19. Now, 
I report that in kilojoules, but because this was balanced to be for eight zinc sulfates, this is per eight moles of zinc sulfate. What I need to do is divide this answer by eight, which gives me negative 976.02. And remember that just means exothermic kilojoules per mole of zinc sulfate. And again, I wanna to report to five sig fig because that happens to be my lowest um, significant digit there. So when you are dealing with these type of reactions, sometimes it's easier to balance with whole numbers so that um, in the end, you can just divide your answer by um, the coefficient to get it down to per mole. So there's Hess's law. The last one that we need to do is a method called standard enthalpies of formation. Now, when we're doing standard enthalpies of formation, we often want to first start off with a balanced equation of a reaction that they're giving us. So here they're telling you you are undergoing combustion of propane gas. And in that process, you are producing carbon dioxide and water. Remember, combustion means plus oxygen. And I've put down that they are all gases here. And when I go to balance this, I'm going to balance it um, per one mole of propane because here it's asking us to calculate delta H per one mole. So this time, instead of using whole numbers, um, I'll balance, we've got the three carbons there, we've got the eight um, oxygens, or sorry, hydrogens, so I'm gonna put a four there, and that ends up giving me six plus four here, which is um, 10, so then I will put a five in front here. So that happens to balance quite nicely for us, now, in this particular um, method, this is what the equation tells you to do. Take the sum of the moles of the enthalpy of formation of products minus the sum of the moles times the enthalpy of formation of reactants. Enthalpy of formation means if I was to form um, propane from its elements, so meaning if I was to take propane, and I am going to make propane from carbon and hydrogen on the periodic table. Those are the two elements that make it up. And I want to make one mole of it. So you would balance this so that you've got three moles of carbon and you have four moles of the hydrogen gas because hydrogen exists as a diatomic molecule. If I am forming one mole of this um, compound from its elements in their standard state, how much energy would it be in order to, to do that? And so again, what you would do is you would have to consult this table here. And this is again on the back of your periodic table. It's a standard enthalpies of formation. You can also find it on the review. And I would take a look um, for propane. So here's propane right there, and it reports a value of negative 103.85. So negative 103.85 is what we would consider the enthalpy of formation for propane. So that's how much energy would be released if I'm making one mole of that compound from its elements. So in doing that, what I can do is I can go look up those values on that um, table and I'm just going to put down negative 103.85 above here. I'm going to look up carbon dioxide value and it happens to be negative 393.5 and I have to be careful that I'm looking at the gas and for water because it's water vapor I want to make sure that this is gaseous water and not liquid water so I want to pick the right value and it has a value of negative 241.8. Now I have to take a look at these coefficients here and I'm going to notice why did I not report a value for oxygen? Well, whenever you have a balanced equation, any element that exists um, as it would on the periodic table in its standard state, so if this was just oxygen or if this was just iron and it's not a compound, it's always given a value of zero, okay? So what we're going to do now is we are going to take the sum, okay, of the moles of the product, their enthalpy formations. So here I have three times 
negative 393.5 because that is the enthalpy of formation for carbon dioxide and there's three moles of it. I'm going to add that to four times the enthalpy of formation for water. And then I'm going to subtract the sum of the enthalpies of formation for the reactants. So this happens to be a one. So I'm just gonna have negative 103.85. I add that to the enthalpy of formation of oxygen. And when I work out these brackets individually, I get negative 2,147.71 in this bracket. Remember that a negative times a negative makes this a positive. And when I calculate negative 2,043.86 kilojoules per mole of propane, and again, I just can see that it is per mole because there's only one mole there of C3H8. And that's how we use um, enthalpies of formation. Notice that this is different than when we were using the bond energies. You would do reactants minus products, but with enthalpies of formation, you do products minus reactants, and it's a different table that you have to consult in order to calculate um, the enthalpy. So those are the four methods as a summary, and um, hopefully that all makes sense to you. And if not, you can certainly go back to some of the video tutorials that have been posted to help you um, further clarify.